will be a lecture on the nature of love and friendship, and we'll be um, talking about um, some of the earliest theories, uh, Greek theories of love and friendship through sort of the medieval, the Renaissance ideas about uh, love and into the modern world and uh, up into contemporary times, hopefully even as far as, uh, you know, our age of digital technology and sort of uh, digital disembodiment. And we'll see what these um, new technologies and ways of relating, like videotaping lectures, for example, um, what, are these, what sort of impact do these have on our uh, forms of intimacy? Um, but let's start back uh, with Plato and uh, sort of trace through some of the themes um, that are developed in ancient uh, Greek thought. And we'll, we'll also be sort of uh, turning to the East and getting some ideas about friendship in particular from uh, the Buddha, Gautama, Siddhartha, and also uh, Confucius a little later on. Uh, Plato wrote a series of uh, dialogues on love. Um, I think as many people know, he did sort of these rather, in the middle period and the late period in particular, these are sort of the m more serious dialogues. One thinks of the Republic and then eventually things like the laws. Um, but it was common to uh, Greek culture that, um, you know, as a form of entertainment, there would be these dialogues and conversations. and. Uh, if they decided to, to sort of have a conversation about a very weighty topic, they would cut the wine with water so they wouldn't get too drunk as they had these conversations. Um, and if it was going to be a fun and humorous topic or something more frivolous, then they would drink the wine straight and um, they would basically get inebriated and so everybody would be wasted and uh, there'd be more fun. And, so there's a series of dialogues like this, and one of which is the Symposium, where Plato, through his mouthpiece Socrates, or rather, uh, yes, through his mouthpiece Socrates, uh, articulates some notions of love uh, that have had a lot of staying power. Um, perhaps one of the most famous ones is Aristophanes tells a fun myth, uh, a kind of an allegory of love, where he says in the ancient world um, before we had these contemporary forms, human beings were actually sort of fused together. You have to think about a woman and a man or two lovers of any kind really. Um, and they have really uh, four arms and four legs and uh, the head has sort of two faces, sort of Janus faced faces, you know, going in opposite directions. And um, Zeus thought, well, these creatures are getting too powerful and in order to sort of stop their uh, you know their power and possible rebellion Zeus split them in half and it's a charming story about the way in which we're always in search of our other half you know we have this language today of a soulmate and this was a way in which um, Aristophanes and Greek society was talking about the idea that you need someone else to complete yourself, that you're not whole unless you have this other person. Now it is interesting, it doesn't get much attention, but in the original story that Aristophanes tells, he's, he actually says there's three kinds of people. He says there's men and women and then these whole um, sort of combination creatures. And so that leaves one to wonder, uh, are only some people, you know, in search of their soulmates and in need of completion by another person. Does Aristophanes' story imply that some people are uh, perfectly happy without this soulmate? I haven't seen much on this, but I think it's an interesting issue. In any case, it's charming. It's not really an argument of any kind, but it is kind of a, a, a beautiful sort of intuition pump for thinking about love in general. Now. Um, Plato does talk about uh, another kind of love besides the, the sort of romantic love that we see in this view. Um, of course, the, romant the way of sort of describing romantic love for the ancient Greeks would have been to describe it as eros. Obviously, we get the word erotic from this. And so this is the idea that, of love that is, has either, is either primarily sexual or has a, a large sexual component to it. There is another form of love that's described quite a bit in the ancient world and up really through the medieval world, which is philia. 
And this is basically friendship or familial love, love of family or friendship. And here, um, I think Aristotle uh, does a nice job describing philia, um, forms of friendship. Um, and then there's perhaps a third notion uh, of love, which is um, where you distribute your love or care across you know, the widest possible uh, domain, namely the entire human species. And this is agape, sometimes called universal love. Um, let's quickly just mention Aristotle's sort of types of friendship, and then we'll come back to this later in the conversation. He says, well, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle says there's three basic kinds of friendships. First would be friendships of pleasure, and these are the kinds of things that are, um, you know, you enjoy uh, hanging out with your friends, you go drinking, you play games, you, you play baseball together, whatever. You can easily see that there are certain kinds of people who you enjoy being around. And uh, these can be quite important kinds of friendships, though uh, Aristotle sort of distinguishes them from the more serious kind of friendship. Uh, you can think of this friend who's your mate, but you don't really go to them with your deepest, you know, heartfelt problems and issues. <clears throat> They're just more fun. So that's one category, sort of the friendship of pleasure. And then he says there's friendships of utility. And this is the kind of person who you might work with or go to school with, and you, you engage in problem solving with them perhaps. Maybe you're on a team at work with them. You like them, they like you, you get along well, there's affection there. Um, maybe you do homework together if you're in school. Maybe you ride together. Um, carpool to work, whatever. These are ways in which you can be useful to each other. This Sometimes people think this demotes friendship or this isn't really a friendship, but Aristotle says it really is a kind of friendship. Um, in, the Lat in the Roman uh, world, there, there was a sort of Latin phrase for this, which was uh, do ut des, which means I give so that you will give. It's basically I scratch your back, you scratch my back. And then there's a third kind of friendship, which, which Aristotle does think is the highest form of friendship or truest uh, form, and this is the virtue, of, the friendship of virtue, where you uh, care about somebody for their own sake, not for anything that you can get out of the bargain. So this is somebody who you have a deep devotion to and you want to see them flourish and do well in the world. All right, these are the basic ideas of both eros and friendship. Now let's just flesh out this idea of agape or universal love a little more and then keep, keep sort of circling back and getting more detail and depth on these ideas. Um, agape was originally used um, really by early Christians to refer to the self-sacrificing love of God for humanity. So God was so big and vast and um, <clears throat> powerful uh, that he was able to distribute uh, his love and care and concern to the entire species, in fact, to the entire creation. Um, that's not something that a puny human like us is expected to do ordinarily, but along comes Christianity, quite different in this sense, I think, from the pagan traditions before it, and even the Jewish tradition out of which Christianity emerges, and says instead that um, you can if you can't love all of humanity, you should at least try to love all of humanity because in doing so, you are replicating God's love for the creation and, in that, and resonating God's love for creation, and that's what God wants from us. And so it's our way of improving the world. Um, and also, in a, it's a sign of respect to God. It's a sign of worship. And, uh, you know, presumably it ameliorates many of the troubles of the world to think, uh, that I'm not just going to love um, strangers, you know, beyond my family, which would, my family love would be philia, but I'm even going to turn the other cheek uh, when there's uh, an enemy that um, uh, insults me or, or strikes me or, or whatever the case may be. So there's a, a way in which, you know, you, you could think about agape or universal love purely in a theological setting, but you could also think of it in terms of an anthropological view, which is um, you have this problem as 
societies begin to get larger, the rise of cities starts to happen, you know, roughly around 3000 BCE. And um, you get what's sometimes called the problem of cooperation. How is it that large scale societies are going to have enough stability so that people are cooperating and not killing each other based on these small tribal sort of um, affiliations? And some people have suggested that axial age religions like um, Christianity and in the East Buddhism are come to the, to the rescue in a sense by giving us a way of sort of uh, respecting strangers. Sort of it begins the process of egalitarianism. So you could think about universal love in this way, and it's a rather more anthropological view, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas develops this idea further and calls it caritas. Uh, we, would, we might translate this as charity. And Aquinas holds that the habit of charity extends not only to the love of God, but also to the love of our neighbor. So here you begin to see the medieval um, and Renaissance articulation of this idea. It starts to become, really it's there in seed form in the Gospels, but it really becomes one of the major ideas um, of Western monotheism. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, this idea that love might be a form of insanity or a kind of madness. And here this should make kind of intuitive sense to anyone who's ever been in love, I think. Um, yeah, love makes you do things you would not ordinarily do. It feels almost like you have a kind of possession. And the Greeks talk this way too, like you're possessed, in a sense, by eros. We have these other, other wonderful metaphors, you're being shot by an arrow of Cupid. Uh, but the fear was that it was also a kind of uh, road to inner slavery, kind of psychological slavery. You might ha have a sense of, of desire for another person that's so deep that it causes you to betray other people who you care about. It may cause you to betray your own drives and goals and expectations. And so it, it has this ability to turn you into a kind of um, uh, a, an, an, an internal slave of the psyche. This is developed very clearly in Plato's Republic, um, where he says, you know, somebody whose erotic drives go unchecked, unchanneled, uneducated, uh, they end up having this kind of soul of a tyrant. Um, so you'll see that this theme is repeated and articulated all through Western culture, but also it's fairly common in Eastern thought to point out that love is a kind of craving and that cravings are a kind of enslavement. And so in Buddhism, you oftentimes find that the Buddha is trying to help us to master these kinds of cravings so that we're not tortured by them and they don't cause uh, the sufferings of attachment. Um, so there have been hostilities to attachment in general um, the erotic uh, sort of slavery thesis, I think, is fairly clear and obvious to most of us. Uh, perhaps not as obvious might be the hostility towards filial love or friendship. Uh, but there have been, you know, critics or enemies of filial or familial love, too. One thinks about um, Montesquieu famously said that the truly virtuous person would have no friends because... Um, if you have, you know, a small group of friends or you're really devoted to th these two or three people, then you're actually going to be biased and sort of giving them preferential treatment, <clears throat> excuse me, and that means you're not able to distribute your love and affection universally across everyone. You're too distracted by these two or three or five people. And uh, similarly, Gandhi, in his autobiography, uh, famously said, well, that he had tried, in order to achieve a saintly universal love, he had tried to scale back any sort of personal affections between him and friends and, and lovers. And so he thought the best thing to do if you want to be a saint is don't love anybody too much uh, because that will create bias and preference when what you really need is this egalitarian saintly love of all. Now, there's been some people who, who have been critics of this, um, my, myself. Uh, I find this uh, rather uh, untenable, 
And instead, I would follow the argument of uh, someone like George Orwell, who, when he, when he read um, uh, Gandhi's autobiography, he said, well, I think Gandhi you know, uh, is great in other regards, but he seems to have gotten something wrong here. And Orwell said, there's something um, inhuman about trying to love everyone equally and avoiding these sort of deep, complicating uh, entanglements. Uh, Orwell thought that it was s deeply human to be entangled with others, so much so that you should be willing to kill and die for them. <laughs> And that if they die or become sick or pass away or stop loving you, you have to be open and vulnerable to the possibility of being broken up by this, that your life can be ruined because you're attached to people. And, um, you know, as tragic a view as that sounds, Orwell thought that was really, that's what it meant to be human. <laughs> so, so anyway, there's this sort of back and forth conversation about... Um, how, how exclusionary should love be? And um, there's sort of another interesting area here. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but there has been this interesting question about the relationship between love and knowledge. Um, as early as those um, Greek texts, uh, there was a question in Plato and in Aristotle, um, does love get in the way of knowledge by distracting us, or does it actually help us to come to know things better. And the idea in Plato's Symposium is that there's a ladder of love and that, in fact, the lowest levels of love are these erotic sexual forms of love where you're attracted to another body. But typical Greek fashion, they thought, oh, well, if what you're doing here is sort of like what the animals do, then that must be <laughs> the lowest part or the lowest kind of love. And what we're looking for is something more uniquely human. Um, the ladder of love, as articulated in Plato's Symposium, suggests that you start out by loving individual beautiful things or being attracted to individual beautiful things, like that beautiful woman has a remarkable uh, figure or body, um, or that, that man has a, a beautiful uh, physique. And so you're drawn to that, but then the the Greeks say, well, eventually what you should be seeing is in a beautiful body or in a beautiful painting or in a beautiful sunset is the property of the beautiful itself. So through these individual instantiations, one should also be moving to a more abstract notion of the beautiful. This is, you know, the idea of that there are these platonic forms and that we're using, in a sense, the material sensual world to go beyond the sensual world to the immaterial realm of ideas or forms. And there is some beauty in itself that love is supposed to take us to that higher uh, form of knowledge or wisdom. So, th so there is a sense in which, um, you know, the, the famous term that I think everyone knows, which is, you know, platonic love, people say, well, I'm in a platonic relationship with this person. It really comes out of these uh, dialogues that I'm describing now. And the idea is that the, um, there are ways to commune with another person, one of which would be sexual and physical, uh, but there are also forms of communion that would be mental and spiritual. And the idea here would be um, that you still have, uh, you know, the true meaning of a platonic relationship is you still have an erotic attraction to this person. This is what makes it different from sort of a filial or family love or friendship. You still want this person erotically, but Plato thinks the, the, the better, higher form of love is that you've, you've channeled <laughs> uh, this erotic drive into something higher like uh, you want the good for that person. It's sort of like um, you're, it's not repression in the Freudian sense, but it's like you've redirected this erotic drive and energy. So your friendships uh, and your concern and your relationship or your intimacy still has a kind of strange dynamism or energy which comes from the libido, but you're not acting on that specifically. So that's a notion of 
platonic love that really, I don't know how, how well this translates to the modern world. It, it, may be, it might be connected to the fact that um, there's a kind of love that Plato thinks is higher than heterosexual love, and that is the homosexual love that was dominant in, in his sort of small elite circles uh, of philosophers and, um, and sort of cultural elites of Athens of the day. But it's not clear how much of this then translates into other sort of cultural forms. In any case, um, I think there have been other philosophers that have similarly recognized that loving someone is a special kind of knowledge. Uh, it brings a sp special kind of wisdom because you've entered into a, an intimacy with another person, so much so, I guess, that you, you grasp maybe the, play, the inner play of psychology of another um, at such a deep level that it maybe helps you understand human beings generally. And this, I just, you know, intuitively this seems right to me. Um, then there have been sort of more, more grandiose theories as well, possibly some of the romantics, Schopenhauer, uh, where, again, things like uh, love can drive one to see these sort of higher realities that are beyond the, the world, of, the transient world of becoming. Um, again, these are rather, I don't know, these might be sort of... Uh, encapsulated within their larger romantic frameworks um, and may not translate as well into the modern world. In any case, um, here I said I wasn't going to spend much time on it and I'm, I'm getting stuck in it. Um, all right, let's move on then to uh, a little bit of brain science uh, to see what do we think is happening in the loving brain um, when you're in love, the different kinds of love. And it turns out we are learning more about this in the last 20 years than really any previous era because we've had these ways of uh, understanding the brain. We've come to understand neurotransmitters better. We've come to understand the sort of, uh, some of the top, topographical anatomy of the brain better, the functional systems of the brain. Um, there is a way of thinking of the brain uh, that's really more metaphorical than literal and it's called the triune brain. Paul McLean gave us this terminology. It's not literally the case that there are three brains wrapped around each other, but it's a very helpful way of thinking about the larger functional frameworks of the brain. So the basic idea is something that has made its way into the larger po sort of popular culture. You have this kind of early brain, which is sort of the brain stem, these subcortical regions, and they sort of um, uh, dictate uh, really low-level vertebrate-type um, adaptive behaviors and um, homeostatic processes within the organism, so things like fight or flight, respiration, circulation, this kind of stuff. This is basically sometimes called the reptilian complex. Some people will talk about having a reptile brain. It's because all vertebrates share this main structure and functional orientation deep within the brain. Then wrapped around that is what's sometimes called the mammalian brain or the limbic system. And this is where certain features of the brain like the amygdala, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, that these structures reside and they tend to be where uh, the emotions are identified. The amygdala very famously is where, you know, strong emotions like fear are processed. Um, this is in communication with the level below it, the reptilian brain, but also in strong communication, of course, brain is very interconnected, uh, with the third layer, which is the neocortex. And the neocortex is wrapped around um, the rest of the brain. For human beings, it's the largest in terms of surface area with all those folds, um, the crinkly part of the brain on the outside. And this is uh, where you'll find sort of that that body map that many people are familiar with. The frontal areas of the brain are where executive function uh, reside, um, higher level thinking, planning, uh, inhibition, this kind of stuff. 
Um, this is a helpful way to start, uh, and then we have to sort of go into the brain to see what's happening during experiences like love and lust. Um, all right. Uh, in the case of lust, uh, there's a whole series of, there's a sort of brain signature that we understand now uh, that is connected to the pleasure centers of the brain, the ventral, ventral tegmental area pathway of the brain, which is also an important area for addiction. So it turns out that when you say, I'm addicted to love, actually your brain really looks like it's in the same state of activity and basically there's a strong flow of neurotransmitters like dopamine that looks very similar to addiction to cocaine, for example. So you have steroid increase, vasopressin in increase, dopamine increase, the addiction centers are, are sort of targeted or enlisted in this process. So there is a kind of chemistry, a biochemistry, a neurochemistry to erotic drive or attraction. The, Dopamine is rising and rising, and this is sort of an anticipatory state. You know how you're chasing after your lover? Uh, you're not literally, hopefully, uh, but figuratively. And you're basically, um, it's ratcheting up this sense of anticipation, which is very intense. And it, it feels like this uh, terrible um, itch, which you need to scratch. So all these metaphors are, are so we've identified some of the neural correlates for this stuff. And so this, um, it's interesting that, that the anticipation actually is highest before you get the, the reward. And uh, then the system, once you have a consumatory uh, experience, in the case of pursuing something like chocolate cake, it's eating the cake. But if it, in the case of pursuing sex, it's actually orgasm, then the system recalibrates and resets to homeostasis. So the system has a way of ramping up and ramping up, and then um, it's able to quiet down. I mean, there's actually uh, affective neuroscience, and here I'm thinking about the kind of emotional neuroscience that Dr. Yak Pangsep um, uh, discovered and articulated. Um, he says, well, there's a list of you know, mammal uh, emotions that we share with other, uh, other mammals, and one of them is lust. And if you look at the um, a chimpanzee or a squirrel or a human being, the lust system, when the animal is ramping up for uh, sexual coitus, uh, obviously this has been selected for to, to propagate the species, it looks very similar in the body and in the brain of all mammals. So the system we inherited from our, you know, our cousins, uh, or rather from our progenitors and that we share with our cousins, is a, called a homologous system, which means we've got basically the same lust system, the same um, rage system or anger system, the same fear system. And so uh, that's fairly exciting, uh, an understanding that Darwin himself glimpsed and sort of, he gave a sort of a promissory note about this, but really in the last 20 years, uh, people like Pangsep and Damasio and Richie Davidson, they've sort of begin to deliver on that promissory note and give us a better sense of this, um, of this uh, neurochemistry. Now, one of the people recently who's given us a very clear picture of what's happening in the brain during pair bonding is a uh, neuroscientist named Larry Young, and he's at Yerkes Primate Institute at, at, at um, Emory in Atlanta. And he does work with other mammals, particularly prairie voles and meadow voles. And he's been able to show that um, there's a different brain chemistry to that kind of deep connection that you have when you marry somebody and you stay with them the rest of your life. So monogamy is not, obviously you know, monogamy is not um, a very common uh, phenomenon in the animal kingdom. There aren't many organisms that pair bond for life. Um, one of the most devoted monogamous species is the prairie vole. And what Young's work has been able to demonstrate, and I think it's very impressive, is that the main ingredient in this pair bonding is oxytocin. 
So you may have heard of oxytocin as a neurotransmitter. Sometimes it used to be called the love hormone. We now understand it's more complicated than that because oxytocin tends to amplify affective states that can mostly be positive uh, intimacy forms, but can be negative as well. But when you, after the honeymoon is over and you're sort of, you know, you're in love with somebody for years and years and you're, you know, you have this di much different, this sort of different kind of intimacy, you know, the on the couch, the, the eating together, the, the spending time together, the, the having of children and clocking decades together. This turns out to be a form of intimacy that, you know, we've recognized for a long time as a kind of bonding, but it turns out that oxytocin is the main ingredient. Now, um, if you look at prairie voles, what Young discovered was that it's not that they have more oxytocin in their system, uh, but they seem to have more oxytocin receptors. So they're able to take in the oxytocin that's produced in the, in the body and in the, um, uh, basically oxytocin is a hormone that has targets in the brain and in the body. It's oftentimes a crucial ingredient in how mammal mothers uh, let down milk. So it's part of the uh, development of the mammary uh, gland system. So even when uh, human mothers are about to give birth, there's a huge flood of oxytocin within the body of the mother. And what's happening is the mother and the baby in this flood of oxytocin create bonds through touch, uh, tactile sense, smell, vision, all this stuff connected with this oxytocin flood is what bonds babies and mothers or caregivers together, which is why once a baby human is born, you know, it used to be you take the baby away from the mother, but now, of course, you put the baby right on the chest of the mother. You need to have some skin-on-skin, face-to-face contact because this is what glues together the mother and the child. We have dramatic evidence of this in the case of other mammals. Sheep, for example, they can only bond within a one hour time period. So what happens is when the mother gives birth to the lamb, <clears throat> uh, she spends this time then licking the afterbirth off and the baby suckles and there's this very strong physical contact between the two. If uh, you actually remove the baby from the mother right away once born, and so scientists have done this, um, and you come back you know, two hours later and reintroduce the, the baby to the mother, the mother will reject the baby because this oxytocin flood within the mother has now dissipated. And so it's a very short window in which you can bond with your offspring for, for many mammals. I mean, you can see why this would be a very short window if you're the kind of herd animal, you know, like an ungulate, like a sheep, that has to be careful and, and has to basically glue together with their offspring and offspring to caregiver quickly because there's predators everywhere. So you can't take years to, to connect, you know. You've got to glue the, the offspring and caregiver together and it has to happen quickly. Now, what's interesting is what scientists have been able to do is if you um, bring the baby back to the mother sheep and she's rejecting the, the baby, you can inject oxytocin directly into the brain of uh, the mother and this will reopen the bonding window, which is amazing. And then she will be able to bond again with her offspring. And it turns out that this system, which looks fairly mechanical, um, in the case that I just characterized, is also the same system that's operating within human beings. And we know, we have a lot of evidence, for example, that people who um, sadly are born in, babies who are born in war-torn countries and have to be uh, quickly put into orphanages and they, because they don't have the resources and the caregivers to give them the kind of physical contact for bonding, they may spend, um, you know, years in cribs or in, you know, containment, getting food perhaps, but not much, you know, care or, or physical stimulation. And as a result of this, the oxytocin window of bonding closes for them and they end up having attachment disorders later in life. So it looks like for human beings, the work that's been done on this is interesting. I think the, I think the guy's name is Pollock in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> 
what it looks like is that human beings are able to bond with a caregiver um, any time between birth and, say, uh, 18 months to two years. If you don't get caregiver stimulation, uh, then that window of bonding closes and the child has very hard time forging strong bonds with friends and family and lovers later in life and all the way as adults. So you can see that some of these things like filial love and affection have neurochemical roots um, and, and correlates. And so we're starting to understand that better um, than we did before. Um, in addition to oxytocin, what's happening when you're with people who you care about um, or who care about you is that you have a release of these endogenous opioids. So you have a kind of, uh, you know, you've heard about endorphins. You have a kind of internal opioid system that gets triggered during touch and intimacy and uh, just commerce and communication with uh, people you care about. And so when you're not getting that kind of experience, it's almost like you're going through a kind of heroin withdrawal. You're going through an opioid withdrawal. It's just that these are internal opioids. So then you spend time with people who you care about and it's like getting a fix or a hit <laughs> of your, of your uh, favorite opioid. So this is to show you that, um, again, things like love and even things like friendship have a kind of um, a physiological um, sort of underwiring and that the system ramps up until it can be satisfied and then you, you return to these states of, that, we, that we recognize as homeostasis. All right, um, so let's then turn a, to friendship and give a fuller discussion of friendship. We'll try to give the same uh, level of, of detail here as we've tried to give to love. Uh, so let me just remind you of Aristotle's notion of friends. He's got these three categories, as we described, friendships of pleasure, friendships of utility, and friendships of virtue, or when you care about someone for their own sake rather th than anything you can get from the, the uh, relationship or experience. Now it's worth uh, at least noticing something that Aristotle doesn't get much attention, but again, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle says uh, there are three kinds of creatures who you cannot be friends with. I mean, there's lots of stuff you cannot be friends with. He thinks, uh, he doesn't think you can be friends with rocks and trees. Um, that might seem obvious, almost laughable in a way, but you're going to see here in a moment that um, there are other traditions and other individuals who think you can uh, be friends with rocks and trees and even have uh, love, be in a loving relationship with objects. Um, objectophilia is one form of it. Possible that animism is another form of it. In any case, Aristotle says, you might think you could be friends with God, but you can't. You might think you, be, you can be friends with animals, you can't. And you might think you can be friends with children, and you cannot. And they're all sort of related arguments. He says, um, the reason why you can't be friends with God is that God is just too vast, um, too vastly different, too vastly powerful, too intellectually remote in a way. If God is perfect or at least, you know, complete, then you're like an ant um, to a human. Your relationship to God is... You're such a puny mind and um, such a, a finite, um, I don't want to say pathetic, but you, you know, in comparison to God, we're, we're, we're rather pathetic, that we couldn't possibly offer God anything. So there would be no reciprocity at all. Um, now that doesn't entirely rule out friendship because I do think there are, and Aristotle admits that there are very uneven kinds of friendships. Um, he thinks, for example, you know, there are very deep kinds of apprentice-master uh, relationships between you and another. You, oftentimes to your teacher, you're an apprentice, and that person has greater wisdom, and it's not at all even. But there is a kind of reciprocity. It's just kind of uneven. So it's possible that you could have a, a relationship with God like this, 
but Aristotle's God is uniquely almost like a machine, not like the Western personal God of later, of sort of, of, of the Hebrew tradition or of the um, Christian tradition or, or the Muslim tradition. God for Aristotle is the unmoved mover. He's more like a first principle, and it's almost like, um, he's more like a mathematical formula rather than a person. And in that sense, it's hard to have a, any kind of friendship with a mathematical formula. Now, the objection to being fr friends with animals is interesting because here the problem is that animals don't have rationality, he thinks. Um, and as a result, they, you can't enter into the mind of the animal and the animal can't enter into your mind. You might come home from work, feel awful, feel depressed because you just got laid off and you could be sitting on your couch and maybe you you start crying or something and you know it's kind of amazing the way dogs in particular are able to sort of read the emotions of human beings and they'll come and comfort you that i think is kind of you know remarkable and anyone who uh, has a pet i don't know about cats here cats strike me as less uh, affection in this regard and i'm sure the cat lovers will will disagree with me on this but animals basically can have, I think, strong emotional bonds with human beings, but um, it remains unclear how much we could share in terms of a, a kind of uh, intellectual life. And for Aristotle, he thinks for real friendship, you need to be able to enter into the, the uh, intentions of the other person. What are their hopes and dreams? And of course, language allows us to articulate this. And with animals, we don't have a shared language, except we have a kind of shared communication system, which it would be the same kind of, you know, touch and the sort of body language that that we uh, that conveys a great deal of, you know, semantic content. But it um, it's sort of linguistic creatures like us that that are able to enter into each other's uh, mental states and psychology in a way that, that can't be done with animals. And uh, thirdly, Aristotle thinks you can't be friends with children. Basically, it's the same argument, although you know, the difference here is that children of a certain age are, are sort of like animals <laughs> in, many, in all kinds of obvious ways. Uh, but they uh, do, of course, being human beings, their potential for uh, rationality is eventually actualized over time and then we can enter into the mental life with children and they can enter into our lives too so that we can of course become friends with uh, children of a certain age. I don't, I don't know what that age would be but you get the, you get the general idea. Um, you can love children of course and uh, be deeply devoted to them the, the point here is that Aristotle is reserving the notion of friendship for a very specific kind of uh, relationship and that I don't know when a kid is intellectually sophisticated enough to really share, you know, your mental life with them and vice versa. If I, maturity is what we're talking about here, I suppose, and, and for some kids it's going to be early and for some kids it's going to be much later. Uh, the reason why, why, why I bother to go through this is that it's very interesting when we get eventually here, we're going to get to our contemporary time. We're in all kinds of weird, strange relationships with new technology, and we're also trying to relate to each other through new technology, videotapes. I'm not, videotapes, look, what a fossil, I know. <laughs> People think, I say videotapes, okay, boomer. Um, what I'm saying is uh, video streaming, um, our, our phones, Snapchat, Instagram, it raises this question about how are these technologies influencing things like friendship? And that's why we spent a little time on this because we're going to come back to it in a moment. Let, let me give you a little, a quick snapshot of some very important um, ideas about friendship that come from the uh, original Eastern texts, in particular um, the Buddhist texts from the Theravada tradition. And here I'm I'm drawing on just one, we could, we could spend all day on this because the Buddhist scriptures are massive, but the Theravada tradition um, is largely contained in the Tripitaka, which is a huge body of scriptures, and within that uh, we have a sutra called the uh, Siglovada Sutta, which is within the Digha Nikaya. Anyway, 
more than you need to know. This is a, a very important um, sutra for Buddhists because it contains within it a sort of recipe or a kind of um, advice about how human beings should relate to each other in their social relationships, husbands and wives, children and parents, employers and employees, teachers and students. So it's a very down-to-earth, practical sutra teaching of the Buddha. And it's interesting that in it, he has a list of what he considers to be uh, real friends and what he considers to be false friends. And it's worth looking at this because this is a basically a, a document, a scripture that goes back to, you know, we're not entirely sure when the Sigaluvada Sutta was written, but probably somewhere between the, the fifth and possibly the second century uh, before the Common Era BC. So this is a very ancient scripture, and in it, the list of friend, real friends versus false friends seems incredibly modern to me. So I, I just show you here, uh, here's what he says about false friends. He says, uh, that person appropriates his friend's wealth. So if you have somebody who's basically skimming off your own uh, money, they're always showing up you know, at the pub with you, and they never have any money to buy the round, this kind of person, if it's always like this, or they're looking for a way to, to get your money, that's not a real friend. Um, the false friend gives little and asks much. The false friend does his duty out of fear. So this person is not, does not love you because they want you to flourish or see you do well. They'll help you because they're afraid. If they don't, then things will go badly for them. Uh, the false friend associates uh, for his own advantage. So he finds people that, you know, will be advantageous for him to know or to suck up to. And basically, this person is a kind of sycophantic personality. Um, and uh, finally, uh, he tries to gain one's favor by empty words. So this is the flatterer. This is somebody who sort of tells you what you want to hear all the time, rather than giving it to you straight. Um, by contrast, the real friends, the Buddha says, is somebody who helps you and guards you. Um, secondly, it's somebody who is the same in happiness and sorrow. And here, what, um, what he seems to be meaning is probably two, two related things. That when they're happy and when they're sorrow, the friend is still somebody you can count on. And secondly, the suggestion is that when you're happy, they're happy. When you're sad, they're sad. So there's a kind of mirroring that occurs through empathy when you really care about somebody and the true friend has a very strong empathic connection with you. Um, thirdly, the real friend gives good counsel. So here again, you don't just say what, what the person wants to hear, you tell them something that you think will actually benefit them, not you. Um, you reveal, uh, the good friend reveals his secrets and keeps yours. So this is a fairly important point. You, you know you have a good friend when they're able to sort of dig into that deep, dark stuff and give you access to it, and you feel comfortable doing the same, and you feel safe in the sense that you're not going to be betrayed by this person. And finally, this person, uh, the good friend, encourages ethical behavior. So they want you to be better you know, than your hedonistic self. They're challenging you to sort of go beyond um, and what's interesting is that if you look at, um, you know, roughly around the same time that the Buddha is living and teaching in northern India, you, you go across into uh, China and you'll find uh, Confucius or Kongsa uh, living and teaching uh, in, on the mainland in China. And the Confucian scriptures are... Um, broad and involve all kinds of things, in, in, including uh, rites and activities that are very rit ritualistic. But philosophically, most of his important ideas are contained within a text called the Analects. Uh, Kongsa's dates are 551 to 479 BCE. And um, you see how contemporaneous this is with the Buddha, because the Buddha is uh, at least in the Theravada tradition, is thought to be born around 563, so they're really very close contemporaries. In the Analects, you find some wonderful statements about friendship, too. So this is the Chinese perspective on friendship, and 
Um, what's important about Confucian ideas is they, they don't just characterize China. These Confucian culture, it really um, is clearly uh, the defining philosophy in places like Korea, Vietnam, uh, Japan to a certain extent, um, and so yeah, and, and to a larger to a, to a certain extent Southeast Asia. Although Southeast Asia has been more influenced, I think, by the sort of Indian cultures of Buddhism and Hinduism and Brahmanism before that. But you have to think about Confucianism as a sort of Asian, as Asian deep culture. So the Confucius says, uh, the master says, quote, if you are virtuous, you will not be lonely. You will always have friends. So there's a sense in which the person who has uh, a high level of virtue, um, or de, uh, it, the Chinese word for this is de, uh, this person is able to sort of, almost like a magnet, draw other people to him or her. And so the virtuous person always has uh, friends around them uh, because they are a kind of inspiration and they're, it's like a moth to a flame. There's something about uh, virtue and uprightness that is very attractive, he thinks. It's, it's sort of connected for Confucius to charisma in a way. Not always, but at least in significantly. Uh, Analex 12.24, Tsung Tzu says, uh, the noble man uses his refinement to meet his friends and through his friends develops his zhen. And zhen is the Chinese word that doesn't have a very good translation, but it means like your humanity. Sometimes some earlier translators said, you know, the junzi is the gentleman and the gentleman has zhen. But this is kind of rather gender specific. And I think the Chinese way of thinking of this is that the, the truly uh, noble person, the really good person, which in Chinese is the junzi, has a property it has properties like virtue, but the sort of they're really like excellent, and this excellence quality is called ren, and so you want to you want ren uh, in your friends, and you want to be uh, enacting ren uh, for your friends, uh, rather than giving into your base impulses. You want to be this sort of more refined uh, version of yourself. And you want to bring that out in your friends too. And it's fairly common in Chinese traditional culture to think that when you're born and you have your natural tendencies, you are just still a kind of simple, crude version of what you could be. And it's the goal of Chinese education and refinement to sort of polish you. <laughs> and really, you're not a complete and full human being until you've studied and perfected. And this is learning certain things about culture um, or when, um, but also um, controlling yourself and learning forms of inhibition and self-discipline that the rights uh, will allow you to achieve. So friendship is very much tied in with this idea of developing yourself as well in Chinese culture. Now, let's look at some paradigms of friendship. I was thinking about what are some cases where we would say, well, that's a classic case of friendship. And I was, I was thinking about, um, you know, literature and eventually films. And of course, um, you see some wonderful films um, about love. And, you know, that's obviously relevant to the earlier part of the, of the lecture here. Things like um, In the Mood for Love by Wong Kar Wai or, um, you know, the... Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I think I got that title right. I'm not sure. That's clearly an interesting story about the relationship between love and memory. Um, many great films about love and also friendship. But when I was thinking about friendship in particular, I was thinking one of the earliest stories we have in human culture is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And if you read the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's a beautiful story about friendships between a friendship between Gilgamesh and uh, Enkidu, or Enkido. Um, Enkidu and uh, Gilgamesh are basically two um, men who go on these kind of hero adventures. They go and kill the monster Humbaba and take the 
cedar forest, uh, take cedar from the forest there. And, but then Enkidu uh, dies, and um, Gilgamesh is struck with the problem of mortality. He realizes that uh, somebody he loves, uh, that any of us love, can, can die and go away. And he has a deep pain and sorrow, and he, he spends sort of the latter part of the Epic of Gilgamesh trying to figure out what does it all mean, what's the meaning of life, sort of facing his own mortality. Uh, other great friendships uh, are a great female friendship in the Bible between Ruth and Naomi, um, Jesus and John. Oftentimes, John is thought to be Jesus' best friend or most beloved. Uh, the Buddha had a best friend. Uh, his name was Ananda. Um, a great cartoon friendships like Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, film friendships like Th Thelma and Louise. Um, a lot of people really liked um, sort of the television serial Sex in the City and then sort of a secondary one called Girls. Many people will be familiar with these. Um, you think about people are really drawn to the Shawshank Redemption as a film and as a story. It's partly a story, great story of revenge, but it's also a wonderful story about friendship. Uh, Woody and Buzz Lightyear. I mean, so there's wonderful features of pop culture and classical literature that celebrate fr friendship. And one thing for us to think about is what are the ingredients that go into these friendships? Why did, are they such great um, sort of paradigms or paragons, uh, paragons of friendship? Um, let's look uh, briefly then at what are the cases in which friendship seems to develop in a fairly natural and almost inevitable way. And here I'm thinking about cases like classmates and workmates. Um, sports teams, like when you're on a team with uh, people, you end up forging friendships together with them. When you perform music with people in music groups um, or arts groups, um, if you're in the military together, a band of brothers is a fairly now common parlance, which people understand that if you're in some difficult and troubled scenario with people, you end up forging very strong empathic bonds with them. They become like your brothers and sisters, like siblings, even though they're not really kin. They're what you know anthropologists and uh, philosophers might call a fictive kin. They're, you don't share blood with them technically, but you are able to uh, forge a cultural family with them through shared experiences. And so this leads me to suggest possibly a, a central criteria for friendship. And the es essential criteria here would be shared experiences. You have to do things with people in order to become friends with them. You, you can't just um, read about them or uh, sort of engage with them in a very remote fashion. You have to sort of clock time with them, spend time with them. Uh, this doesn't always have to be face-to-face, -face, as we're going to see, and as I think we know in the modern world, but you have to share experiences. Even if it's gaming online, that is a kind of shared experience. You have your friends who you're, you know, you're engaged in some, you know, shooter game or you're trying to capture the other team's, you know, munitions in some, some uh, online gaming. That's still a kind of shared experience. Um, but of course, these other forms that I'm describing, sports team, music, military, these forms are much more embodied forms of a shared experience. Secondly, I'm suggesting you have to have some kind of shared intentionality. You, this, is, this is why we went through that, that whole thing with Aristotle. You have to enter into the mind of the other person and they have to be able to enter into your mind. So you have to be able to share hopes and goals. What are your, you know, what's, what's your sense of your own purpose? And you describe this and you constantly sort of um, present it to your friend and you get feedback on it from your friend. The technical term, the philosophical term for, you know, your, pur your purpose is your teleology. And you have to be able to enter into the teleological goals of another mind, another agent. And they have to be able to enter into your agency for you to have a kind of a real friendship. And third, um, you need this component of loyalty. 
which is that you have to, the other person has to be there for you and you have to be there for that person. And that means it has to be something that can be enacted. It can't just be on paper, like the, the sort of paragon of, paradigm, paragon of friendship would have to be a case where you have to actually go to the wall for somebody. Um, you have to actually sacrifice something for the other person. Uh, it could be just, you know, that person's sick, and even though you want to go out to the club, you really, as a loyal friend, you're going to take your friend, you know, chicken soup or whatever it is they need, or go get the medicine at the pharmacy and drop it off for them because you're loyal. Um, that is something that I think we can share with animals. I do think dogs are extremely loyal, even though they can't enter into the the intentionality cr criteria of friendship that I was describing before. So this criteria is, it's almost like a human being with another human being can f basically t uh, fulfill each criterion. But we're in a relationship with other kinds of creatures and devices that that sometimes fulfill one of the one of the criterion, but maybe not all three of the criteria. So that's something worth paying attention to as we move forward. All right, now let's talk about our own digital age and what we think is going on here. Uh, we're living in strange times. Um, we're transitioning rapidly to online life. The average American spends around four hours on their smartphones every day, and teenagers are spending up to nine hours a day online. According to a 2018 Pew report, almost 90% of 18 to 29 year olds regularly use social media. Now, in my own informal um, uh, polling, I find that the numbers are actually higher than this. In fact, much higher than this. I think people, you know, millennials and Gen Z um, are actually online even more than this. Um, and uh, that's something to, that we have to keep in mind here that I think there are many people who wake up in the morning and they're on some kind of device until they go to sleep at night, usually by setting the device down on the side of the bed. <laughs> um, and that is um, possibly a frightening and disturbing new development. Um, although I, I'm gonna argue here, I'm not gonna do the usual, uh, isn't this all terrible? I'm gonna try to look for some silver linings here in the course of this conversation. All right, in 2016, the American Academy of Pediatrics released a policy statement warning, quote, children who overuse online media are at risk of problematic internet use and heavy users of video games are at risk of internet gaming disorder, end quote. Worries about the cognitive and social impact of online life previously came from technophobes, but a recent poll reveals that 32% of tech professionals also believe digital, digital life will harm our physical and mental well-being over the coming decade. So it used to be just, you know, the Luddites who were complaining about, um, you know, technology. But in fact, people working in Silicon Valley in tech design, in gaming, in, at Facebook, at, you know, at the various social media platforms, they too are getting increasingly nervous and worried about the way in which Digital life, digital life is consuming uh, human, the human mind and um, human culture. So let's think about this in terms of friendship. Um, let three possibilities. Uh, one, digital life uh, could be replicating all the essential criteria of friendship that, that we listed. Um, so there's nothing to worry about. That is the most optimistic and possibly naive view um, in other words, being online with people through Snapchat and, and Instagram and Facebook um, gives you, according to this view, the same kind of shared experience, the same kind of intentionality, and the same kind of loyalty that a regular old, you know, face-to-face -face friendship had. Um, I think uh, most people find that one rather dubious, but with varying degrees of, of incredulity. Number two, here's another possibility, that digital life fills and absorbs waking life so that people do not engage in paradigm cases of friendship. For example, those paradigms of sports, collective arts, free-range childhoods, and so forth. In other words, di digital life 
contributes to certain kinds of social, social isolation. The argument here is that it's not that digital life itself is intrinsically uh, bad or you know that it's basically like cocaine, <clears throat> although it does seem to fire some of the same addictive areas of the brain and triggers a lot of dopamine. Uh, but the argument here is that it's preventing you from doing all of the good things that build true friendships. So it's just sort of keeping you in your house and preventing you from engaging in sort of face-to-face -face, uh, social uh, experience. And therefore, you're not using those muscles, the social mus muscles that we evolved to have and to use. And as a result of it, it's just um, giving you an unfulfilled uh, social world. The third argument is that digital life produces false friendships or pseudo-friendships. So this is the most pessimistic argument. Because they are relatively disembodied or they fail one of the other criterion, uh, digital life contributes to certain kinds of social I isolation. So here the argument is not that uh, being online all the time is preventing you from doing other things, but rather being online is also giving you the sense that you have strong connections and friendships when in fact you do not. Um, here's the argument that always makes me laugh is um, one time I was, uh, my son was playing a shooter game with his friends online and uh, I said to him, you know, uh, well, he had this buddy who his, um, his sort of avatar identity online uh, name was a scuzzball or something. And uh, I said, well, wh who is Scuzzball? He, he, my son was like, eh, Dad, don't bother me. He, he, I think he lives in France. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He lives in France. And uh, then after further conversation, it came out that uh, my son didn't know where he lived. Maybe he was in Canada. And then a little later, it came out that um, even though he described him as his friend, he didn't know anything about him at all, really, uh, except that he was sort of fun, and they ended up playing online games together all the time. And um, then what would happen is his friend would leave the game, his friend would leave the game, and he would, the friend would be replaced by a bot. So an AI, artificial intelligence, would just step in and continue to play as that character. So your team isn't broken up, you're still playing with your team. But now your friend is gone, and it's literally like an AI bot with no real agency that's in the place of your friend. And I said to my son, well, isn't that sad or unfortunate that not... And my, my son was like, it, it happens all the time. It doesn't matter. The, the game goes on. In other words, the, the friend seemed extremely, uh, the friends in this world seemed very fungible. Like, it didn't matter who they were. And honestly, a decent AI could do just as well as them, so you don't really need them. I only use this as an analogy, an analogy that I think many people can identify with because we are either playing the games ourselves or watching our kids play these games. And the point here is, are you, in fact, do you think you have friends and you call them friends, but really would they be there for you? Are they false friends? Because they don't have the level of loyalty that um, a friend that you developed at, in summer camp would have, or a friend that you went to school with would have. So that's the interesting question is, how loyal can online friends be? All right, according to a study published in 2006, and obviously that's an old study, but it's, it's only gotten worse, uh, people had an average of about three friends they felt that they could discuss important things with uh, in 1984. So the study is done in 2006. It looks back and it says, look, people, you know, Gen Xers, uh, they basically said they had three close friends. By 2005, the average number of confidants had dropped to about two. At the end of the study, close to 25% of the respondents said that they didn't have anyone that they could truly trust, uh, triple the proportion from two decades ago. So it's pretty clear that isolation is on the rise, and people do not feel that they have a, a very strong friend that they can share deep, really deep stuff with. Um, so there's a quantity question here and also a quality question. How deep is the friendship and how many friends do you have? So let's consider uh, digital social life. Are there levels of embodiment that you need in order to have good friendships? Social media, uh, if you think about it, uh, how do you engage with people? Well, 
email is one way, messaging, uh, sharing memes, posting and responding. Uh, these have low level levels of affective and embodied immersion. You're not really sharing the physical space with your friend. Let's say you and your friend are sharing me memes with each other. There is an affective or emotional component here because oftentimes a good meme is funny or it's cruel or it's, you know, or it has some strong emotional content. So somebody shares a good meme with you, you laugh and you feel like you're connecting with your friend through this emotional connection. But in another sense, you, you're not sharing the same physical space or you together are not engaged in a, in a embodied interaction. I mean, think about just how many ways you interact with somebody at summer camp. You know, you, you play games with them, you're doing tug of war, uh, tug of rope, um, you're sailing a, or rowing boats with them, or at a music camp, you're playing together in an orchestra. Y you, it, it, it's hard to, to sort of um, overestimate the level of embodied uh, interaction that you're having. You're really sharing a lot of the same kind of activities with your body as this other person. And as we said before, the neurochemistry of bonding suggests that these are very important uh, elements in triggering the kind of dopamine and oxytocin experiences that forge strong connections. Dopamine is very pleasurable and you can be gaming with somebody or sharing memes and you get a good laugh and you get sort of the pleasure centers of the brain, get these squirts of dopamine. But the kind of bonding that we talked about before that's deeper and longer last, lasting involves oxytocin and endogenous opioid releases. And here it's harder in these disembodied forms to actually get those kinds of um, uh, sort of neurochemical cocktails. All right, in, let's look at another kind of digital social life console and app gaming. And here I do think you have more intermediate levels. This involves more embodiment. When you're gaming with people online or like with consoles, you'll see the whole body gets involved. You, have, you know, if you game, it's actually better if you watch somebody else game. So watch your friend game. Um, though oftentimes their whole body will be twisting and jerking and jumping like the character or the avatar will be. So there's a sense in which the body is really being involved here. Um, and then I think a much higher level of embodiment would be what's still coming in terms of technological development namely enhanced reality and virtual reality. So gaming in these suits, or perhaps you're you know, with the goggles so that the physical space is also enhanced. And you can maybe share a physical space with your friend and they're in a remote region. You can still go through the adventure together. I mean, uh, my family and I, we did this, um, we put on a sort of virtual reality suit, fairly crude, but still compelling. And then we went through this kind of uh, experience as uh, it was sort of like we were characters in Star Wars and we were a team that had to solve this problem together. It was just this wonderful sort of adventure and it felt like, you know, you're shooting and the person's exploding in front of you, but there's also your, your brother or your, your daughter or your sister and uh, your, even your chest is vibrating when you're getting hit by somebody else's, you know, uh, lasers and so forth. This, it seems to me, well, it's exhilarating, but it's a very strong level of bonding because even though it could be remote, you see how much embodiment there is in this process. Now, um, there is a sense in which I think, uh, you know, there are many kinds of friendships that we might be losing out with, uh, losing out on with uh, digital forms, but I want to now make a kind of um, positive, optimistic argument. And it's, this is a little strange perhaps, but uh, it's worth spending a little bit of time on this. The question is how much can you be friends? How much can you actually have a love relationship or some kind of intimacy with um, technology or inanimate objects, um, with things that are maybe designed to appear as if they have agency, something like a social robot um, or AI generally. You know, we are increasingly surrounded by these objects. My Alexa is right over there. Alexa, say hi. Hello. 
Um, and we've got uh, Siri and we've got uh, all these <laughs> sort of devices. I have, you know, the robot that, um, that the, the Roomba that vacuums, you know. And I find myself falling into easy communication and strangely even vaguely emotional connections with these objects. And I know that you're not that much different than I am. Um, how much of this, how far can this go? You know, obviously the great science fiction writers and filmmakers have been exploring this idea for a while. Philip K. Dick with his uh, novella, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? was really interested in this question of how far could the technology of social robotics and AI go such that we could interact with them as if they were not just animals but or animate or agents but even humanoid and could even an awareness develop in these creatures such that the robots themselves might come to think of themselves as agents. Now I want to bracket that question off to the side because that's a big and it, it's an interesting topic. What I'm more interested in is this other question of how much can we enter into intimacy and empathy with things that really don't have consciousness. I'm talking about my Roomba, I'm talking about Alexa, I'm talking about our cars and increasingly our cars and our smart homes. Um, I think uh, this is turning out to be much more interesting and weird than we thought it was going to be. So let's look at um, what are some of the social robots and social AI. All right, um, Alexa and uh, mobile Alexa is increasingly sort of connecting to us. Kismet is a robot head that understands and exhibits emotion when interacting with humans. Tico is a robot developed uh, to improve children's motivation in the classroom. Uh, there's some kind of social robot called Bandit, which is designed to teach uh, social behaviors to autistic children. Jibbo is a consumer-oriented social robot. Jibbo understands speech and facial expressions and seeks to form relationships with the family that adopts it. And then, you know, there's other stuff like uh, Hitchbot, which was a robot that was supposed to hitchhike across the country. <laughs> the, fu the funny part about Hitchbot is that I think, I don't know how long it took, but it was a very short time. From the time that it was released and sent out into the world, I don't know, maybe a couple of days passed before it was, uh, you know, beat up and decapitated and left on the side of the road. So people obviously weren't bonding too well with Hitchbot. But in any case, what are the functions of these social robots? Well, extended mind intelligence services. We put um, things like our memory out into these devices. This is generally no, known as an extended mind thesis, that there are features of the mind which have been offloaded or downloaded into the environment or into our devices, and we go to them to figure out, you know, we use Google Maps to figure out where we are and to navigate space, spaces. Some of us will remember before there were these devices, we had to do that all in our heads or, you know, with a map, but in a way a map is also an extended mind. Um, social robots are continuing this trajectory of how human beings have been able to sort of create um, a cognitive niche out into the world where the mind is, is sort of scaffolded uh, into the environment in ways that other organisms uh, can't do or do to sort of minimal degree. Telepresence, uh, they provide remote meeting att uh, attendees uh, with a physical presence in a business meeting. Um, obviously, we're engaging in a lot of that now during the time of social distancing. Um, they'll, they will increasingly uh, provide companionship, but they're doing that now. They provide emotional support to the young, the elderly, or the disabled. We're going to look at a couple of examples of that briefly. And then customer engagement. They provide uh, potential customers with an information about products and services, store hours and pricing. And increasingly now, you call up and you get a social robot that is able to do a lot of problem solving or these bots online that can chat with you and do a lot of troubleshooting before, you, you know, you, you may never even need to get to a, you know, a customer service human being. There's still some of this that can be done by these social robots. All right. Uh, interaction with human-like AI and robots produces an illusion of in-group solidarity and also activates our empathic system. 
uh, the affective empathy and bonding is non-adaptive in the sense that AI cannot catch the contagion and cannot reciprocate the affective bonding. The adaptive social benefits like cooperation or in-group bonding of normal human emotional contagion are neither triggered nor are they needed in human AI interaction. AI does not have the conscious feeling states that undergird empathy and they do not need to feel shared intentionality with human beings in order to help them since they are effectively slaves of human programming. Okay, what does this mean? What I'm su suggesting is um, you, you, if you look at some classic examples like think about um, HAL 9000 in 2001, um, we could have an emotional bonding or emotional entanglement with HAL, but HAL doesn't, isn't really catching your emotional contagion and then helping you. HAL is programmed to help you and will help you no matter what. Now, HAL 9000 can read when you're emotionally distressed and want, you know, HAL wants to tell you know, Dave to take a stress pill because he's angry and is slowly you know, uh, detaching or um, decommissioning HAL, uh, but HAL does not operate by the same empathic mechanisms that mammals do. Your dog reads that you're upset, catches the contagion, and then engages in consoling or comforting behaviors. HAL and AI, social AI does not operate that way. It, it is increasingly learning how to read your emotional states by your voice, by changes in your face, and then it will be programmed to offer you responses. So you'll come home from work, at some point Alexa will be able to read your face or at least hear in your voice that you're upset or sad, and then I suspect Alexa will start to play um, songs that you like and that you find comforting automatically to sort of help improve your mood. Um, I, I just sort of invented this in my head, but I, I got to think there's a lab working on this now. That this is probably already you know halfway there. All right, so then let's look at this. Um, this interesting question about empathy without a we. Uh, non-dyadic social emotions. There have been these wonderful cases where, you know, in you know movies like Her, you'll have a human being interfacing with a social robot or a social AI, and then eventually the social AI will become so sophisticated that a real bond forms. Now, again, I don't want to jump to the sort of easy case where consciousness evolves in the AI, and therefore we have a real agent on our hand. I don't think that's in the mix anytime soon, and that's not, I think, the interesting case. That, of, that sort of leads us to avoid the more interesting case, which is what if AI is just acting as if it's intelligent or has consciousness? How far is our emotional empathy going to be triggered or hijacked by you know, that form of AI? And it turns out that it's fairly significant. So we mentioned... Um, Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Blade Runner obviously is very interested in this question. Um, now, here's what I sort of want to raise as a, as a sort of um, consequence to this. Um, we, you know, evolved these empathy systems to connect with other human agents so that we would cooperate with them and we would solve problems together with them. But if you live in an age where you can have all of these social and cognitive and emotional problems solved by non-human agents, then my question is, is empathy the new appendix? You know, yeah, we have an appendix and it seems to have been another stomach and it seems to have been involved in breaking down certain kinds of food in a kind of pre-homo sapiens diet. But then once we had the diet that we're familiar with and we had cooked food and this kind of thing, the appendix turns out to be vestigial. Uh, now, I'm just going to bracket out more complex evolutionary theories of the appendix here, but I'm just simply using it as a metaphor to say maybe our emotional connection with other people, we're not going to need it in the future because we're, we're going to have devices and AI that sort of takes over and does this stuff for us, and we can have a very fulfilled life um, through social robots. Now. That seems extreme, but there is a kind of phenomenon of the hikikomori in Japan, which are young people living a life entirely like hermits. They, they, they've gone to 
grade school or high school, and maybe even they finish college, but then they live in their homes entirely um, without leaving it. So they connect through pe to people through online, uh, you know, through the internet. They order their food and the food is delivered to them. They work entirely from home. They engage in their entertainment from home. They date and have maybe even sexual fulfillment with sexual robots, presumably that's coming, if not now, that's down the road. So in a sense, what I'm suggesting is you might get all of the emotional ingredients of intimacy uh, entirely through uh, these non-agent or remote agent uh, relationships. And that is uh, very interesting. Uh, that might be the future for us. This sort of strange image that you see here on the right is perhaps more confusing than helpful. But what I'm suggesting here is that there's a kind of system. I'm just This is another graphic from Affective Neuroscience, which suggests that our affection or uh, desire for friendship and for love is almost like a... Um, it's not a, just a response to stimulus. It is going out into the world like a, an arrow, looking for targets. And the point of this theory is that it lands on targets and achieves then some consummation and then return to homeostasis. So if you can get that uh, return to homeostasis through sex robots or through artificial intimacies, then it's possible that the system will be uh, satisfied to a degree that's necessary and therefore uh, human beings will be fulfilled in this fairly artificial way. Now, what I'm suggesting here is the kind of as if bonding, and that's sort of a one-way bond. The, the best possible scenario would be that you're bonded with another person who loves and cares about you and can enter into all those high-level intimacies that we talked about. But what if you can't have that? And it turns out that people can feel very fulfilled. These are kind of marginal cases or or sort of outliers, but they are telling. People can have strong intimacies with objects. Um, these objective files that I referred to earlier, people who experience emotional intimacy with inanimate objects, the, perhaps the most famous case is this woman who's in love with a plane, a jet plane. One might be um, tempted to laugh or scoff at this kind of thing. On the other hand, um, there there might be something happening there that is just a more extreme version of a system that we all share, a sort of affection system. Uh, there's also evidence, for example, of a virtual therapist called Sim Sensei, who's been, you, you basically call up the therapist, the therapist comes online on your computer and is an animation and is programmed to say sort of gently comforting things that elicit you to sort of tell your story. And while that seems like it wouldn't be particularly cathartic or effective for you, struggling with your various, um, you know, neuroses, it turns out that people report feeling much better after talking to an AI therapist. And so this suggests that there's something very fulfilling or at least potentially fulfilling about these strange one-way as if intimacies. Um, a classic example of this from the recent literature is um, a social robot named Paro that was introduced into a Japanese um, elder community uh, and this group of elderly Japanese were rather isolated from each other. They were relatively lonely. They didn't have much in interaction with each other and they introduced this little robot that was kind of a fluffy little seal and it would make some noises and move a little bit fairly crude and it tremendously improved the social interaction of the people but also the affective mood the oxytocin those internal endorphins um, physiological systems were improved blood pressure went down uh, stress went down stress hormones were reduced so it's pretty clear that um, again some of these social robots can enhance by hijacking our empathy systems and our social systems, they can actually be good for us. So um, perhaps the most um, interesting or perhaps the most obvious case is this uh, wonderful film, uh, Castaway, 
uh, with Tom Hanks where he bonds with a, uh, I think it's a volleyball, which he, um, uh, he names uh, Wilson. And um, he has no other options here, so he has a kind of social, instinctual drive and since it can't be uh, satisfied with other agents, he does it with non-agents. Um, so this is, just reminds one of, a, of an older philosophy, uh, sort of post-Kantian philosopher, Hans Weinger, developed this idea of philosophy as, of as if. Um, in his philosophical works, uh, the philosophy of as if, uh, he proposed that man is willingly accepts falsehoods or fictions in order to live peacefully in an, in, in an irrational world. So it's very common um, to pretend as if you had these friends and then you actually get some of the benefits of pretending these are your friends or your lovers. We can see other forms of as if life um, in the case of religion. Uh, this is a huge topic which we're not going to get into but some people have suggested that at least believing as if there is a God in his heaven and that everything's going to turn out all, all right has all kinds of comforting and consoling uh, emotional and psychological benefits. All right, why does as if bonding happen? It's this system that we talked about before, which is the care system or the attachment uh, system. It goes out into the world like a kind of limbic ar archery and it fastens onto uh, various objects. The goal is for it to fasten on to somebody who you can fall in love with and who will reciprocate with you, but sometimes that person doesn't re reciprocate. In fact, most of the time that person doesn't reciprocate. You, it's a one-way infatuation. They don't feel the same way about you as you feel about them. And it can be miserable in that case. <laughs> but if it can, if it, it can also be still rewarding, strangely enough, and also exciting and um, strangely addicting too. Um, so that suggests there's something really coming out of you as an agent that's going into the world and grabbing onto love objects and cathecting onto them. Uh, so the argument here is this could be happening to increasingly to the social robots once you start, certainly once you start putting in, them into more humanoid forms, I think the connection will be even more obvious. Another way of thinking about this is that we tend to think about uh, the world in with a kind of animist cognition. So just like um, people in Southeast Asia might think about the forest, or people in Na Native Americans might think about nature as having, you know, a spirit consciousness within it. The river has a, is an agent. The spirit is a person, or the, the river is a, is a person. The tree is a person. The mountain is a person, and that we should have a kind of spiritual relationship with these persons. These persons. So too, um, that view of the world might not be primitive at all, as it's oftentimes been characterized in sort of early anthropology and sort of more prejudiced views of, you know, religion, it might be that that's a kind of uh, form of cognition that all of us have, a tendency to think or anthropomorphize uh, inanimate objects into persons. It's why children, for example, are, are very good at sort of imagining that uh, spoons and, you know, um, dolls are in fact alive and that they can sort of play with them as if they're alive and as if they're agents. There might be something in all of us like this that slowly gets um, tamped down through scientific literacy and education, uh, but it might still be there in a kind of nascent form or a kind of rudimentary form. And our interaction with technology might be raising this form of cognition again and activating it, triggering it sort of animism 2.0, a sort of a technological way um, of seeing many kinds of persons in the world, only some of whom, you know, are, are humans. All right, uh, so what are the benefits of this as-if bonding, treating agents as if they, non-agents as if they were agents, if, you know, having friendships with technology? Well, agency projection creates salience and attention amplification. So, uh, you see this in animists like Native Americans. If you think that the river or the tree is alive, you might attend to it very carefully and therefore you might learn lots of things about your local environment that a more cursory or casual attitude 
uh, would not detect. So there's a sense in which Native Americans, for example, know a lot about their local uh, ecologies and deep knowledge about the environment, and it may be connected to the way in which they personify nature. Secondly, agent attribution provides a teleological structure and a causal predictive power. In other words, if you think of nature or your technology as having purposes, then it gets you to sort of predict what are they going to do next. And this helps you sort of, if the mind is a sort of prediction processor, it might help you understand, you know, other social agents and your environment better because you're better at predicting what they're going to do next. Um, it stimulates and fulfills these affective or emotional drives that we talked about. Uh, it also helps you understand yourself better. You know, even if you love an object or, you know, um, something that can't love you back, it does slowly teach you something about yourself. That's kind of an interesting upshot of all this. Um, all right. Then there's interesting questions about whether any of this is true or not, or whether it's actually adaptive and helps you emotionally. And I don't want to spend much time on this. I, I just want to point out that there's two ways of evaluating this kind of relationship. One would be, well, it's all BS and it's all, you know, it's bullshit. If, you, if the person can't love you back, then it's not love. If the friend cannot enter into your personal life um, in, with intentionality and real conscious cognition, then it's not real friendship. I get that argument and I respect it. On the other hand, there's another way of thinking about this, not as to whether it's true or false, but to whether or not it's uh, emotionally valuable, to whether or not it's meaningful to you, to whether it's pragmatically valuable. And here, I think the criteria of evaluation would be different. Here, I think that there, we see a lot of benefits to this kind of intimacy with objects and an intimacy through digital uh, forms of media. It does clearly you know, we're getting increasing data on this from empirical psychology, but it looks like people do benefit therapeutically from these kinds of connections, even if they are as if connections or as if friendships. All right, that's a lot of information. What we did was we toured um, what are some of the main ideas about love in philosophy and science. We looked at some of the main ideas about friendship in philosophy and science. And finally, we looked at what are the implications of all this uh, given our incredible uh, recent technological developments in terms of digital technology and online life. So um, that's enough to keep you thinking for a while and um, we'll come back and discuss uh, another topic here shortly. All right, goodbye.